Hey guys, my name is Jessica and welcome back to my channel where I explore new true crime cases each week. If you have an interest in true crime like me and you'd like to join me back here each week, then go ahead and subscribe to my channel and let's get into today's case. Today, we'll be discussing the murder of Mary Lynn Witherspoon. Mary Lynn Keels Witherspoon was born August 14, 1950 in Sumter, South Carolina to her parents Gamewell and Eleanor. The couple also had three other daughters, Mary Lynn's sisters, Jackie, Kay, and Jenny. Mary Lynn seems to have always been a really driven woman. She loved doing volunteer work, she participated in beauty pageants growing up, and she even graduated high school as valedictorian. After high school, she went on to college, earning her undergraduate graduate degree from Winthrop University and her master's degree from the University of Charleston before moving on to teach French at Charlestown Academy. She remained active in the community into her adult life, volunteering at the local children's hospital and participating in the Junior League of Charleston, which is an organization committed to promoting volunteerism, developing the potential of women, and improving the community. Mary Lynn is always described as beautiful inside and out, just the epitome of a Southern belle. After college, Mary Lynn was briefly married to a doctor. During this marriage, the couple had a daughter whom they named Jane. However, they did eventually decide to divorce. Once her marriage ended, Mary Lynn unintentionally attracted a lot of attention from men. A family friend once said that everyone wanted to marry Mary Lynn, stating that she had to beat them off with a stick. Eventually, Mary Lynn did find herself in a relationship with a lawyer by the name of Edmunds Tennant Brown III. The Brown family was one of Charleston's oldest, wealthiest, and most well-known families. Edmunds, like Mary Lynn, was a single parent. Before they'd met, his wife had actually walked out on him and their two children. He had a daughter named Molly and a son who carried on the family name, Edmunds Tennant Brown IV. However, he went by Tennant. Tennant was the oldest of the two children. He was 10 years old when his father began dating Mary Lynn in 1981. Now, Edmonds, Mary Lynn's boyfriend, remember there's Edmonds the dad and Tennant the son. It's confusing because they technically have the same name, but they go by different names and whatever. Anyways, Edmonds, the boyfriend, really took a liking to Mary Lynn's daughter, Jane. The two of them got along really, really well more so than he got along with either of his biological children, which eventually started to really bother Edmund's daughter, Molly. She really grew to resent Jane for soaking up all of her father's attention. Throughout their relationship, Edmunds asked Mary Lynn to marry him on multiple occasions. I mean, he was really trying to lock shit down. But Mary Lynn was like, I don't know, your daughter kind of hates mine and your son's a little off. Even though the family was like, like rich, rich, and Tennant had always attended really prestigious schools, he struggled socially, and Mary Lynn noticed this, so she made a point to try and bond with him during family activities. She would show him love and attention as often as possible, but he didn't make it easy for her. He really seemed to latch onto her kindness in a way that she found inappropriate, and more often than not, she felt uncomfortable being around him. And after eight years, when Mary Lynn ended her relationship with Edmonds in 1988, Tennant did not handle it well. Even though he was 18 by the time the relationship ended, it really seemed to have a negative effect on him. And it wasn't long until he started showing up uninvited to Mary Lynn's home. He didn't say or do much when he was there, He'd just kind of stand there and stare. Yeah, she thought it was weird, but Mary Lynn didn't feel threatened. She had known him since he was a child. And when you've known someone that long, it's hard to really ever view them in a different light. I mean, the kid I used to babysit is in high school now. And I'm like, aren't you four? And Mary Lynn was very much the same in how she viewed Tennant. To her, he was still a young boy that had trouble fitting in. She figured maybe he had an innocent crush on her and that he wasn't hurting anyone by being there, which he wasn't at first. But during a trip to visit her mother, Eleanor, in 1989, things started to escalate. Mary Lynn was in Sumter, which was a couple hours north of where she was currently living. She and her mother went out one day and came home to find that her mother's home had been broken into. And the women were rattled, but they were really relieved to find that nothing appeared to have been stolen. However, when Mary Lynn returned home and began unpacking, she realized that some of her clothing and makeup had actually been stolen during the burglary. And when she told her mother what she'd discovered, Eleanor knew immediately 
that Tennant was responsible. In fact, she was so sure that she called Tennant and told him that he needed to return Marilyn's belongings to her as soon as possible. And wouldn't you know it, a few days later, a bag with the stolen items showed up in her garage. So basically, Eleanor is a badass. Tennant was clearly escalating, and this incident did freak Mary Lynn out, but she still refused to press charges. She still believed that he had no ill intentions and was probably just going through some stuff. And she seemed validated in this belief in 1991 when Tennant's visits stopped. She actually didn't see Tennant again for years, and she believed that her issues with him were behind her. She settled back into her life and resumed doing the things she loved. She traveled, she volunteered, and she genuinely just enjoyed her life. Until one day, Tennant came back. But things were different now. Tennant was 30. He wasn't just an awkward young boy, now he was a man, and suddenly the whole thing seemed much more intimidating. But she still didn't report him to the police, even though it was creepier now, she still figured that there was nothing illegal about him just standing around her property. Her family and friends, however, were on a whole other page entirely. Some of them even went so far as to reach out to Tennant's father, Edmonds, and told him that he needed to get a grip on his son. But Edmonds and Tennant had become estranged over the years, and he really didn't think there was anything he could say or do to change the situation. So Tennant continued to stalk Mary Lynn, and in April 2003, while she was doing laundry, she realized that all of her underwear were missing, and she knew without a shadow of a doubt that Tennant was responsible. But she still didn't file a formal police report. I wanna stop here and say, I don't want anyone thinking or having the nerve to comment like, why wouldn't she file a report? She should have called the cops. That's victim blaming, and it's surely not welcome here. She took precautions that she thought were appropriate. Hindsight's always 2020. Instead of filing a formal report, she installed a high-tech alarm system, she put mace and a panic button on her key ring, and she did talk to some local cops that she knew about what she was experiencing, and they told her that they'd keep an eye on things and watch her property for tenant. So it's not like she sat back and didn't do anything about the situation. Just because she didn't do what you say you would have done doesn't mean she was wrong. A couple months later, when Mary Lynn got home one evening, she found tenant standing in her backyard. She did her best to ignore him and went on with her evening, and he did eventually leave, but he then came back the next day. And when Mary Lynn noticed him in the backyard the next day, he was accompanied by a pillowcase full of her clothing. And instead of quickly leaving, because he just got busted, he stared at her. But it was different this time, and this freaked her out more than anything he had done up to this point. Her sister? also freaked out when she heard what happened. And she told Mary Lynn that she was worried. Tennant was continuing to escalate and she was scared to find out just how far he might go. But Mary Lynn told her that at this point, she was more worried about what would happen or how Tennant would react if she did press charges. But her sister, as well as other family and friends, continued to pressure her until she gave in and filed her first formal report against Tennant. And he was actually arrested pretty quickly and charged with burglary. Up to this point, Tennant had been living fairly transiently, working odd jobs, and committing a series of nonviolent crimes, for which he was actually already on probation when he was arrested for breaking into Mary Lynn's, which totally violated it. So he was denied bail and held in custody while he awaited sentencing. While Mary Lynn was relieved that he was in jail for the time being, she knew that it wasn't gonna last forever. So she registered with Vine or the Victim Notification System, which is meant to notify victims when their perpetrator is either transferred or released. Mary Lynn figured by registering, she would at least know exactly when Tennant was set to be released and she could prepare herself. And this brought her an enormous sense of relief. She knew that for the time being, she could relax without having to constantly be looking over her shoulder. She could finally get back to living her life and everything seemed to be going really well until November 14th, 2003, when Mary Lynn failed to show up for work. Knowing that this was super out of character, the principal and another coworker of Mary Lynn's actually went to her home to check on her. But when they got to the house on Trad Street, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The house looked undisturbed and Mary Lynn's car wasn't home. But they just couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, which is why they ultimately decided to reach out to Jane. Mary Lynn was just not the type of person to miss work without letting someone know or without setting up a substitute teacher for her class. At this time, Jane was living three hours away in Rock Hill, but she and her husband immediately made their way to Charleston because 
Jane was beside herself. She had a feeling that something was very, very wrong. She didn't want police to wait until she got there to look into what was going on. So she gave them permission to enter her mother's home without her. When they entered the home, they realized immediately that everyone had been right to be worried. Mary Lynn's shoes, watch, and a half-eaten apple were scattered on the floor right inside the front door. It was very clear that a struggle had taken place in the home, and it didn't get any more reassuring as police continued through the house. Moving upstairs to Mary Lynn's sitting room, they saw that it had been completely trashed, and it wasn't like Mary Lynn to live like this. She was known to always keep a very neat and tidy home. Police then discovered 53-year-old Mary Lynn's body in the master bathroom. She was naked in the bathtub, her hands and feet were bound, and she had been raped and strangled to death. Her family couldn't believe it. They felt like they were living a nightmare. Mary Lynn had been such a light in their lives, and she was just gone. Everyone's first thought was that it was obviously Tennant that was responsible. It had to have been him. But Tennant was in jail, wasn't he? Mary Lynn never mentioned getting word that he was being released. However, when asked if she knew anyone who might want to hurt her mother, Jane still mentioned Tennant, noting that from her understanding, he was currently in jail, but he was the only person she could think of. Everyone would soon learn that this was not the case at all. In fact, just three months after his arrest for the burglary of Mary Lynn's home, Tenet had been released. So why the hell wasn't Mary Lynn notified? What happened to the Vine system? Well, it turned out that the incorrect information had been entered into their system and three separate automated phone calls were made to Mary Lynn, but the calls were to let her know that Tenet was being transferred. Not released, transferred. So even if she had gotten the calls, the information was totally incorrect. But protocol at Vine was to attempt the automated calls and if contact wasn't made, then they would send a letter to the victim notifying them of the information. This letter arrived the day after Mary Lynn was murdered. It also contained the incorrect information. When police found out that Tennant could actually be a suspect because he in fact was not in jail, his picture was distributed so they could begin a search. But it didn't take everyone long to realize that he looked familiar because he'd just been walking round and round Trad Street the whole time, watching police and talking to Mary Lynn's horrified neighbors. Police decided to see if Tennant would return again once the scene calmed down a bit. So they left, or at least they made it look like they left. And then they waited 20 whole minutes, in fact, they had to wait for Tennant to return to the scene of the crime. They stopped him and tried to ask him some questions, but he lawyered up quick. Luckily, they were able to arrest him right then and there because he was walking around with Mary Lynn's house keys. While booking Tennant back into jail, police noticed that his crispy new driver's license listed his home address as Mary Lynn's address. And they noticed that he was wearing Mary Lynn's clothing. And when they found Mary Lynn's car, they stumbled across scraps of paper that Tennant had been practicing her signature on. And a FedEx package arrived at Mary Lynn's home after her death that included breast forms, makeup, a blonde wig, and a drag video. I want to clarify that there is nothing wrong or weird with a person who's assigned male at birth wanting to wear breast forms, wear makeup, wear wigs, or wanting to watch a drag video. Where I do draw the line is murdering someone and purchasing those things with their credit card in hopes of taking over their life. He truly thought he was going to kill her and then become her and no one was going to notice. Police were able to confirm with DNA what everyone already knew, that Tennant was in fact responsible for the rape and murder of Mary Lynn. Based on the evidence found at the scene, it's believed that Tennant ambushed Mary Lynn on her way to work that morning, that he forced his way in the front door when she was leaving for work, and then he forced her up the stairs. But Mary Lynn didn't go easily. She had kicked out one of the spindles on the staircase in her attempts to fight back, but Ultimately, Tennant overpowered Mary Lynn, getting her up the stairs where he raped and strangled her before placing her in the bathtub. After murdering perhaps the only person who'd ever shown him genuine kindness, Tennant headed downstairs to Mary Lynn's kitchen and made himself breakfast. Eggs that were partially eaten and left on a plate on the counter, found by police later that morning. As Mary Lynn was laid to rest, her family couldn't help but wonder, how did they get there? How did Tennant slip through the cracks? How did he even get the opportunity to take Mary Lynn from them? They wanted answers and they were going to get them. 
So they started digging into any information they could get a hold of on Tenet. They were eventually able to determine that in 2002, Tenet had been diagnosed with gender dysphoria, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. While he was in jail for breaking into Mary Lynn's home, Tenet was to receive court-ordered counseling and medication for his mental illness, and he was also to be strictly supervised. Under these conditions, after just a few months in jail, Tenet was released to an outpatient mental health program where he would continue to receive counseling. He met with his counselor on Monday, November 10th, 2003, where once their meeting ended, he was rescheduled to return on Wednesday, November 12th, but he was otherwise released into society pending his trial. Upon his release, Tenet didn't have many possessions on him, but among what he did have was a notebook. This notebook contained Tenet's manifesto, if you will. While in jail, Tennant wrote daily of his frustrations and his plans to murder Mary Lynn and take over her life. He wrote things like, get a stun gun, take care of MLW, and put her on ice. His rage had grown in prison, and he very clearly had a plan in place before he ever even left. Tennant never showed up for his follow-up appointment with his court-appointed counselor, which should have been flagged by the pre-trial services agency. Supervision was a condition of tenant's release and his compliance with these conditions should have been being monitored. Pre-trial services should have reported the violation to the court immediately when he missed his follow-up appointment, but none of this was followed up on. And these oversights, coupled with the breakdown in the Vine system, left Mary Lynn vulnerable to Tenet and ultimately led to her murder. Tenet pleaded guilty to the murder and Mary Lynn's family opted out of a formal trial. They wanted to preserve her privacy as much as possible and they knew that a trial would publicly open up her life in ways that they simply weren't comfortable with. The state was fully ready to seek the death penalty in the case, but since there was no trial, a judge sentenced Tenet to life in prison without the possibility of parole for Mary Lynn's murder. He is serving his sentence at Lieber Correctional Institution in South Carolina. But Mary Lynn's family was still pissed about the systematic breakdowns that led to her murder. If Tenet had been monitored the way that he should have been, it's probable that Mary Lynn would still be alive today. In 2005, Mary Lynn's sister Jackie wrote a letter to South Carolina Congress detailing her sister's case, a letter that she hand-delivered. And they agreed. Something absolutely had to change. And Mary Lynn's law was signed by Governor Mark Sanford. The law improved victim notification procedures, increased victim rights, and increased penalties for stalking. Jackie was hopeful that the law would eliminate the systematic errors that led to her sister's murder. In 2006, a lawsuit was filed by Mary Lynn's family against the Charleston County Sheriff's Office, the State Department of Mental Health, and the South Carolina Department of Corrections. The suit alleged that their carelessness was in part responsible for Mary Lynn's death. The family wanted those specific organizations held accountable for their oversights. Tenet, who now goes by Catherine Brown, did request a new trial on the grounds of inadequate representation. However, this request was denied. In 2016, Catherine Brown petitioned the court for a state-funded gender reassignment surgery, but she was denied regarding this matter as well, and Catherine continues to serve her sentence for Mary Lynn's murder to this day. And that's pretty much the case. It's so sad that Mary Lynn was such a kind and beautiful person and that her life was so carelessly overlooked by the court system and so senselessly taken as a result. Rest in peace to Mary Lynn. I hope her family has found some sense of peace from the outcomes and the support they've seen, but honestly, with something that could have so easily been prevented, I don't know how you could ever be fully at peace with that. I thank you guys so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to Mary Lynn's story. If you haven't yet and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I explore new cases here each week, and I hope to see you here in my next one. Bye, guys.